All right, hi everybody, uh, and we are back on another virtual lecture, uh, PowerPoint presentation. We are switching chapters and starting contaminant transport today. Uh, this will be the first of six lectures. Uh, you have the menu here on the right, so today I will go through the introduction for the chapter and introduce transport. Uh, transport equation, so advection, dispersion, uh, the mechanisms linked to it, and then the equations that we use to describe transport. Uh, in the next lecture, I'll go through solutions and examples. Um, and then after that, we'll get into reactive transport. Uh, and more specifically, we'll study sorption first and then homogeneous reactions. And finally, the last lecture will be on remediation. So what do we do when there is contaminant in the groundwater, basically? Um, here you can see on the uh, left-hand side, on the left-hand side here, that um, GMS uh, model that you have to do for Friday. Uh, so this is you know, the tutorial that you'll do for Friday. So you can see here we have a landfill. Uh, that is leaching into the aquifer and you can see the uh, plume spreading out of the landfill into you know the domain so we'll, that's basically what we'll be uh, studying is how those processes work and how we actually model so what's behind if you will uh, the GMS simulations here okay so let's start with the intro and again uh, dreaming about your groundwater class if you remember from chapter one, so now we're really jumping back to the first uh, lectures in this uh, course. How much groundwater do we drink again, right? So how much groundwater do we drink? Why do we care if groundwater is contaminated? Well, mostly because we use groundwater and more specifically because we drink it, right? So that's a problem if uh, there is pollution in there. Um, again, you can see here there's a pump right pumping some groundwater for maybe a house and then you know that goes directly to your um, fountain here so again we don't want contamination uh, in this water uh, and again to answer that question uh, specifically what we want to focus on for today right I'm not going to go through this whole thing again but you'll recognize this plot from chapter one and here the part that I'm highlighting right is the domestic and public supply of drinking water and you can see for domestic supply groundwater is overwhelming the overwhelming source right again uh, individual have wells you know if you're not connected to public supplies basically you have a well and that's groundwater uh, even the public supplies you can see here um, there's a bit more surface water than groundwater but we're not that far from 50 50 maybe like 40 60 or something so again a lot of groundwater is used for drinking and we want that water to be pure right drinking quality so beyond this uh, sustenance aspect of groundwater right we need groundwater to um, drink we groundwater is also important for ecological functions right so many habitats uh, are supplied by the discharge of groundwater into surface waters um, or even groundwater uh, habitats themselves are important uh, so I just put a few examples here. So on the top right, the springs, right? So this is literally, you know, groundwater coming out of the floor of the ground uh, and feeding some habitat. Uh, so all the spring habitats you can think of, you know, we want those to remain pristine. Um, of course, here, wet, wetlands and lakes, and these are a couple examples. Uh, you notice that uh, these two papers that I put here are, um, are you know, my papers. Uh, and here's a study where we looked at um, the influence of groundwater on wetlands and you know the uh, hydroecological functions of wetlands so my former students Leonardo spent his whole PhD thinking of those issues basically uh, both on the hydrology side and on the ecological side so hydroecological side um, another habitat that people don't really think about much is the benthos right so benthos is that bottom of river so if you imagine this is the porous media down here Right, so this is below the water, and then this is the surface water up here. There is uh, 
exchange of water between the surface and the subsurface. And of course, at the bottom of the river right here is where all the algae and biofilm uh, live, right? So you can see here, there's a lot of exchange. You know, you can see that plume of uh, rhodamine. It's, this is a dye. Uh, so there's water going, you know, from the surface to the subsurface and back. And again, if there's pollution coming from the regional groundwater into this zone here, then, you know, this whole uh, interface is polluted and this is a very important interface for biogeochemical functioning like nitrate, phosphate, cycling, etc. Carbon, so very very important um, habitats at the bottom of rivers. Okay, so a list of types of contaminants and there are many, we won't see them all obviously, uh, but there's many many different kinds of contaminants you can find in groundwater. Uh, so organic chemicals are a big problem, uh, they bioaccumulate, you know, they're some of them very nasty, hydrocarbons are obvious, uh, inorganic cation and organic anion, so ions and metals and those kinds of things, some pathogens, so there's, you know, lots of issues with, say, E. coli uh, pollution or uh, cryptosporidium, I also have a couple papers on that. So transport of pathogens basically in groundwater and then maybe, you know, contaminating some uh, surface water or drinking water wells, etc. Uh, radioactivity, obviously, we don't want that in the groundwater. There's plenty of issues down in Oak Ridge where uh, the original, you know, atomic experiments were conducted. There's tons of uh, storage down there and, you know, a lot of uh, pollution of groundwater by radioactive materials. Uh, and then finally colloids, so colloids are like solids basically, uh, little particles that can infiltrate, for example, a modern, you know, issue is microplastics, those plastics that deteriorate, um, create little microparticles, and then those things, you know, are found, are pervasive basically in the environment, including groundwater. Uh, just a quick sketch here, I can't remember the uh, source of this, I should have put the source, but uh, in general, right, the broad categories are chemical, biological, and physical uh, contaminants, and you can see the link here on the left to that list uh, to this uh, graph here. So for this course, you know, this chapter mostly will talk about chemical uh, reactions and chemical pollutions, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about colloids towards the end, uh, and colloids can be, you know, biological, so pathogens, you know, cells, or they can be physical, like I said, microplastics and stuff. Uh, so filtering and all that stuff is more on that biological, physical pollution, but most of the chapter will be on uh, chemical uh, pollutants. Uh, and here I put, an, again, an excerpt of uh, FEDER. Um, so we have that Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, I think that's from the 80s, actually pretty late, uh, or pretty recent, I guess you could say. Uh, but we do have maximum contaminant levels, so a lot of those pollutants are... Um, controlled or, you know, there's leg legislation for a lot of them. Uh, so there's a maximum contaminant level for drinking water supplies, right, that need to be respected. And then there's goals that are not really enforced, but, you know, some uh, compound have, you know, a zero goal, for example, but then the maximum possible is, you know, whatever that number is. So all contaminants, basically, you can look up the EPA uh, website and find their uh, allow allowable uh, concentrations. Okay, another aspect, so this was a list of different contaminants. Here's a list of the, their sources, right? And again, this is from Federer. This is from, not from your textbook, but from his uh, Contaminant Hydrogeology, I believe the book is called. Uh, so again, I didn't make this list up. I just took it from Federer. And a lot of the content of these lectures are going to come from Federer again, as we've done before. Uh, again, so these, so the sources of contaminant, right, some of them are designed to discharge contaminants. So let's say septic tanks, right, injection wells. Uh, so we use wells, right, injection wells. For example, the uh, CO2, right, uh, carbon dioxide. Nowadays, there's a lot of research on injecting uh, liquefied carbon dioxide back in the earth, basically, so it doesn't go into the atmosphere. That's an example of, you know, a system designed to basically discharge contamination. Um, land application also, so think of, you know, wastewater sludge, for example, that is extracted from your wastewater treatment plant and then applied onto a field, you know, those things usually have a lot of contaminants with them that go directly on the fields. Um, 
Some sources are designed to store a contaminant as opposed to discharge them. Um, so either store, you know, and slash treat or dispose, right? So again, landfills, and we've seen the example here in that GMS um, illustration. Uh, dumps, obviously, same thing. Surface pools, and these are basically, you know, all your ponds that you'll find in industry to basically store contaminant before it can be treated or released, right? So there's a lot of uh, surface storage, basically, in uh, ponds, surface ponds, that you know, may leak into the groundwater. Uh, stockpiles, again, I talked about this uh, uh, radioactivity, right? We have stockpiles of uranium, for example, and then if somehow, you know, there's a leak, then that creates, you know, issues and groundwater contaminations. So beyond the design to discharge or design to store, you know, you can also leak during transport. So pipelines are a classic example, right? If you blow up a pipe pipeline, then obviously, this, um, you know, whatever it contains is going to leak uh, eventually down to the groundwater. Uh, of course, trucks during transport, you know, I could put boats and barges here, but obviously those are going to contaminate surface waters first uh, or, you know, slash uh, ocean water. So I didn't put them here, but pipelines and trucks are obvious ones. Uh, other activities that create uh, potential pollution, even though they're not designed to deal with, you know, contaminants per se, uh, so agriculture is a big one. Uh, I do a lot of research on that. So everything you can think of fertilizers, for example, pesticides, right, that we apply to uh, crops so they can grow better, uh, but, you know, also leach into groundwater supplies and then, you know, uh, create all sorts of problems. So nitrate, for example, is one that at high levels, like we have here, uh, is actually very uh, dangerous for the health. Uh, salting, you know, road salt in the winter is another example you can think of. You know, we don't put salt to do anything to the groundwater, but eventually, you know, it leaks into it. Um, other conduits, so wells, excavation, um, are other examples that we've, you know, described a lot in, during this course that may, you know, cause accidental pollution, if you will. Uh, and then finally, you know, natural sources, so they can, they may or may not be enhanced by human activities. Uh, but, for example, salt water intrusion, you know, on coastal aquifers, so if you have uh, pumping near the ocean, you know, you're actually uh, increasing salt water intrusion, right, because if you're pumping the fresh water near the ocean, obviously the void left is going to be filled by that salt water, and then you have salting of all your uh, uh, coastal aquifers, which is a big issue, um, both environmental and also for drinking water, because, of course, you don't want to pump salt water. Um, surface water infiltration, again, this is a broad category here, but if you have, you know, a wetland or a lake that is connected to your aquifer and then if that wetland or lake becomes polluted for some reason, right, this infiltration, which is natural, will cause the pollution of your groundwater. So a lot of sources of contamination, potential contamination. Okay, so let's get into the core of this lecture, which is the transport itself. So this was a broad introduction on contamination, and now I'm moving on to actually describing the processes and equations um, that describe those processes uh, of the transport. How do, how do things move, right? How do these contaminants move uh, in the groundwater? So the first uh, case I'll describe, and some of you will recognize that from my 547 course, uh, the first process right, is just concentration gradient. So even if the water doesn't move, if there's no movement of water itself, right? Uh, if you have a, a pollution somewhere, it will move just by concentration gradients, right? So if you have a lot of something somewhere, right, just diffusion will increase its influence, you know, over time. So how does that work? Um, well, there's basically four aspects, right? So this is a little game. You can, you can think of this, so conceptually, right, if you remember this little picture, um, you can back calculate or backtrack uh, the process that influence diffusion. Um, and those are the smaller distance between the two walls, right? So the closer you are from the source, right, the more uh, those particles, if you, if you imagine those are little molecules, right, those little balls here or dollars, uh, you know, the closer from the source you are, the more of them are going to reach you, right? 
um, smaller molecules, right? So if they're like tiny molecules, they can move faster, if you will. They diffuse faster. So the smaller they are, the faster they will diffuse. Um, of course, the area of the wall, right? So if, if you're collecting, you know, from here versus if you're collecting from the whole surface area, obviously you'll have more of them, you know, so it depends on the surface area, uh, the amount you collect. Uh, and of course, the concentration, I already mentioned that, but, you know, the more you have to begin with, right, so the concentration gradient, the original concentration, the more you have to begin with, you know, the more you will receive at whatever uh, observation well, if you will, observation distance you're at. Now, if we put those things together, right, you can see here I put a dollar sign, so imagine these were dollars, you want to maximize your amount. Uh, that will depend on the diffusion coefficient, which is essentially the size of the particles, uh, right here, number two, right? Then the concentration, so number four, the concentration gradient really, but the concentration itself, right, is what drives the uh, flux. Uh, the area of the wall you collect at, so that's number three here. Uh, and then the distance, right, between the, you know, the observation to uh, your distance, which is right here, uh, one. Yes. So one, two, three, four. You have four different variables that influence the amount per time of molecules we get. Okay. Now, so again, I just repeat this equation here. You can see that uh, it's proportional to the size of the diffusion coefficient, proportional to the concentration gradient, proportional to the area and inversely proportional to the distance of the observation to the source. Now we can rearrange, rearrange uh, this equation to express it as a flux, right? So you can see that, uh, again, diffusion here is here, the concentration gradient is here, right? Uh, dx is here, so now we're missing a. So j, the flux here that I call j, is, you know, the amount per area per time, right? So it's like some mass or some number of particles per area per time. That's your flux. Okay, so this is fixed first law, and it just says that the flux is proportional to the diffusion coefficient and the concentration gradient in space. Okay, fixed first law. Uh, now, if we express a, a mass balance, <clears throat> so again, mass balance is just, you know, whatever comes in, must either come out or be disappeared inside the volume, right? So if there's mass in, it can stain the volume, so there's more mass in the volume, or it can come out. Mm -hmm. This is just a statement of mass balance. So again, change of mass per time is, you know, the volume times the change in concentration. Um, and we can again rearrange that as the change of concentration per time is in the minus the change of flux per distance, right? It's flux in, flux out. So this is just statements of simple statements of mass balances. Uh, if we combine or if we carry that uh, calculation, right? So minus d dx of the flux, right? You can replace the flux here by its um, by its value, by the diffusion times the concentration gradient, right? So if we replace j by d dc dx, you can see that now we have the second derivative, right? d dx d dx, that d squared over dx squared, c, and then the diffusion is here. Note that minus and minus cancel, so now we have a plus sign here. So now the change of concentration over time in that control volume, if you will, is the diffusion coefficient times the second derivative of the concentration the second spatial derivative of the concentration, uh, which is fixed second law, right? And this is also known as the diffusion equation. Okay, so this is how you derive the diffusion equation, basically. Start with the ping pong balls or, you know, the little uh, minion uh, cartoon. Remember those four uh, variables that influence, you know, the change of molecules ch uh, reaching that observation uh, observer per time, and then you can, you know, uh, work that out. Okay.
so a couple notes here to conclude on diffusion. Uh, so in porous media, so this was all a general, sorry, a general derivation, right, for a control volume that is filled with water. Now in porous media, the problem again, we have, well, solid particles and we have water in between, right? So that creates a couple of complications that we need to note here. So the diffusion is slower in porous media uh, than in water. Uh, and that's again because now we have particles, so now the molecules diffusing have to go sort of that uh, contorted uh, flow path, right? So if you have a molecule diffusing, here it can diffuse through that solid uh, grain here, so it has to go around it, so it diffuses slower, right? The time to reach this position down here, from here, right, is longer because it had to take that uh, contour, right? So this is called tortuosity. Um, also in porous media, obviously the diffusion only is in pores, so this is similar but not exactly the same, right? Just the fact that there is porosity means that diffusion will uh, only happen in a portion of the volume, right? If, if you have a total volume here, right, the diffusion only happens in the liquid phase, so we have to include porosity somehow. Okay, so now the flux, instead of just being minus d dc dx, actually is minus d star, which is that uh, corrected diffusion coefficient for tortuosity, right? So if you take the, the diffusion coefficient of, you know, any molecule in water, let's say salt in water, you get a number, well, in groundwater, right, in, in a porous media, now you have to modify that diffusion coefficient for tortuosity, so it's actually less. Uh, and again, because it's only in, in pores, you have to include porosity. So really the flux now becomes J equals minus eta, again the porosity, uh, same nomenclature as before. Now this modified diffusion coefficient for the porous media uh, times dc dx. Okay, so this is really the equation we work with for groundwater. That's the difference between the groundwater and just diffusion in water. Um, now, if we calculate again the derivative of the flux, uh, the special derivative of the flux, right, that mass balance equation, again we have to include this porosity term. So really the change of concentration per time in the entire uh, control volume must include porosity, right? So the porosity times the change over time is this equation, right? Uh, so now if we rewrite the whole thing, you can see porosity is on both sides, so that will actually disappear. And then the change of concentration over time will be that uh, modified diffusion coefficient for tortuosity times the second derivative. So we, we end up with a similar equation uh, than the one for just water. Uh, and again, that's because for the flux, you have to include the uh, porosity, and then you have to include the porosity for the change over time. So they end up canceling and you just have the tortuosity uh, that remains. Now, final note for the diffusion, and diffusion only meaning the concentration gradient uh, transport, this is actually negligible compared to dispersion. And again, we'll see dispersion you know, in a couple slides, uh, but remember that diffusion is usually very small compared to actual transport. So when there's uh, velocity, which we'll, we'll see right now, uh, then the velocity differences in the porous media create some dispersion. And again, I will define this in a couple slides. Uh, and the, that dispersion sort of overwhelms the diffusion typically. So diffusion is usually not a very important process, but uh, the derivation I just did is the same for dispersion. So it's really important to understand those fluxes and, and how that works, basically. Okay, well, how about advection, right? So advection is transport due to velocity. And we've seen velocity in porous media before, right, in this uh, class. So we've talked about this over and over. What is velocity in porous media? Well, you'll remember that is the Darcy flux uh, divided by porosity, right? We've done this over and over. So this is Darcy again, uh, that old picture of Darcy. And just, again, reminders of, you know, previous chapter, that's chapter two, uh, where the velocity of the water of the groundwater, of the porous media water, is the Q, the discharge, right, in volume per time, divided by, again, the porosity times the area, right? This is the actual velocity of the flow coming out of a column of porous media. 
Now you remember that Q over A is that Darcy flux, right? So it's Q over, so V equals Q over eta, right? We've seen this over and over and over. So, but this is the velocity we're talking about, the actual velocity of the water, not the normalized flux, not the Darcy flux. Uh, and then finally, because we know the Darcy flux, we can replace everything in the equation, right? Uh, and have Q equals, you know, the KDHDX, which is the uh, Darcy flux uh, times A. Okay, so all those equations that should be, you know, straightforward at this point in this class. Okay, now if we go back to writing it as a flux, right? So now we're interested in those scalar or in those masses or mass of contaminant quantities, so the flux of contaminant due to advection, again V here is uh, the velocity, so the flux is the advection, the velocity of the water times the uh, porosity, right, again because there's only in the flowing water that things move, times the concentration, so this is your advective flux. Now again, like before, right, uh, the, con the change of concentration over time in a control volume or somewhere um, is the first derivative of the flux, so it's exactly the same, you know, as we did before for the diffusion. Now we replace this, now this flux is the advective flux and not the diffusive flux, so we replace with this value V eta C, so V eta D C D X, okay, so now V eta C, V eta C, and then the D dx, D dx, so everything is consistent, right? Once again, you can see that the porosity appears on both sides, so we don't need it anymore. Um, and we find that the change on, of concentration over time due to advection equals minus the velocity times the concentration gradient, okay? And then finally, we're arriving at our, uh, our goal here to put the advection and diffusion together, right? So we have this left side, left hand side term for the velocity, this right hand side term for the diffusion that we've seen before, now we can put them together, right, so we have dc dt equals minus v dc dx, right, the advective flux plus the diffusive flux, so d star again, and the second deriv derivative of concentration. And this is your advection diffusion equation. This is the main equation, right, this is your transport equation. Uh, that we'll use over and over for this uh, chapter. Okay, finally, what is dispersion, right? So I said before, diffusion is negligible compared to dispersion. Well, what is dispersion? Oops, excuse me. So here's a definition or an, uh, an illustration, I should say, of what dispersion actually is. And again, these figures are from Fetter. Uh, there's like basically three different mechanisms that create dispersion. Um, the first one is the pore size, right? So you can see that here we have a macro pore that creates fast uh, velocities or, you know, lots of flux here. And then, you know, maybe some smaller pore where the velocity is much smaller. So if you have fast and slow velocity, now V is not a constant, right? There's different velocities at different places so that, you know, a particle that starts here will arrive here much faster or much before you know, a particle that starts here and will take, you know, a long, 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 long time to get to the same point. So those, you know, at the end here, we get particles that are spread out in time. And that's basically what diffusion does, right? So it's the same as diffusion, but now it's due not to concentration gradient, but to velocity gradients, if you will, right? So now this is the influence of velocity gradients. Now, similarly, right, if you have a flow path that is much longer, Right? This particle here will arrive much later than this particle here just because it had to go, again, that's like the tortuosity story, right? It had to go around and around and around for a long time, whereas this guy had a much straighter path. So again, this guy is going to arrive first, and the top particle will arrive much later. So now we have a spreading time again of that uh, arrival times, and that, that's basically the definition of dispersion. Uh, and then finally, just in, within pores, you'll remember we've done that again on chapter three, uh, like those sort of Poiseuil flow within pores, right? Where you have those concentr uh, velocity distribution with fast velocities in the middle and basically no slip conditions, right? Uh, at the uh, grain interface, right? There's like basically zero velocity to very fast in the middle. So again, 
uh, a velocity distribution, which, which creates then arrival time distributions, which creates then an influence on DCDT, right? If the time changes, then, you know, this term is affected. Uh, so this is what influences longitudinal, right, arrival times, if you will, or how fast things get to a point. Now, the same thing is true on the lateral side, right? So if, if you think of this as, as a top view, you can see that if we all start at that same point, just because, again, of tortuosity, things are going to spread in that second dimension, right? In that Y dimension. Let's say this is Y and this is X, right? So this was all in X here. We didn't consider any Y. So here in Y, you can see there's a spread of the plume that is due to that second dimension, if you will, uh, dispersion, tortuosity. So things go up, things go down, and depending on where you end up, now we have dispersion in that uh, uh, lateral direction. So we can put those two things, you know, in those expressions. So basically we've seen that dispersion is due to a distribution of velocities. So we can see that in the longitudinal uh, in the longitudinal dispersion is proportional to some longitudinal uh, dispersivity or a, a coefficient uh, here alpha uh, times the velocity and you can see that alpha has dimensions of length uh, so velocity of course is length per time dispersion is like a diffusion coefficient right it's a length squared per time uh, so alpha L here is uh, length scale and typically it's related to the grain size right or the distribution of grain so I won't go into that too much but you can see how this works and again plus d star and d star is the same as before this is our modified uh, diffusion coefficient now what I've said before and this is where you can see how the diffusion coefficient here usually is orders of magnitude less than uh, the dispersion uh, coefficient here so that the overall dispersion coefficient, hydromechanical dispersion, uh, is essentially just alpha v, and d star is very negligible. Unless, you know, v, if v goes to zero, obviously, if this is zero, then you can see that, you know, diffusion dominates. But typically, v is much, you know, is enough that the dispersive term, the dispersion term, dominates diffusion. Uh, and this is pretty much it. So now we can put it all together. Uh, in a 2D sense, right? So the change of concentration over time is due to a net vector flux, right? And a dispersion flux. And here I left the 2D uh, version. So there's a longitudinal dispersion in the X direction and then there's a transverse direction uh, dispersion in the Y direction. Uh, and this is our entire uh, ADE equations or advection dispersion equations. So next lecture... Uh, we'll go into solutions. So again, this is just the, um, uh, the differential form of the equation, right? We have change of concentration over time. What we'd like to know usually is what is the concentration, the solution of this equation, right? Concentration at time t equals blah, right? So we want to know what is the concentration at, let's say, two days, right? After two days, we want this answer. We don't, want, we don't really care about the rate of change. What we want is the actual concentration after some time. So next lecture, we'll go into you know, solutions of those equations and examples, basically, of plumes and how they change over time. All right, thank you, and I'll see you on Friday.